Portfolio Builder members, this is October 15th, and we are trading the emerging markets today with a classic smash and grab quick intro, and then we'll jump into today's trade alert and topical news. Daily income trade alerts at noon Eastern, Monday through Friday. Target return of investment is 1% a month, and we've only had one losing month of negative 1% with an average of 1.5% return. Current trade allocation setup is 48% equities, 40% bonds, and 12% in gold. So that means for every block of assets you've purchased, which costs approximately $75,000, or if you use your broker's buying power, would cost you just about $38,000, our goal is to deliver you between $750 and $1,000 a month of income with extremely low drawdown. To do this, we have to have a very smart weatherproof strategy, and this is our setup. So we trade the SPY ETF, the most highly traded security in the world, largest fund in the world, $244 billion, nearly twice the size of Ray Dalio's, and it has option expirations three times a week. So besides having the most liquidity, the best diversity with 504 companies, it also has the best options market, which allows us to sell call options for income and buy cheap put options for insurance against downside risks. The latest trade is to rotate out of silver into emerging markets ETF, EEM. That's our new Tuesday play. And this is because of the surprise deal from Friday where uh, U.S. and China made huge historic progress towards a trade deal. Now, if this breaks down, expect us to go right back to silver. But for the time, uh, it does appear as the two parties do want to create a deal. China is motivated because of inflation, especially in food. They cannot find enough food around the world at the right price. America's the best at that. Uh, and on the side note, they also cannot have all these tariffs, uh, which is forcing them to devalue their currency to offset the tariff costs. So China is highly motivated to strike a deal, and Trump wants to get elected in November. So I do believe phase one will be completed, and then we'll see how phase two can come around. Uh, but if I'm wrong, and I've been wrong quite often, we have a strategy that allows us to profit almost no matter the outcome. Our insurance policy is the TLT shares, which have delivered nearly half of our profits this year, and a buy and hold position in GDX. Now that's gold miners instead of spot gold. So this is our current setup. It's very hard to lose money over a period of time. Typically if SPY goes up, TLT goes down. And uh, every time we get some sort of scare in the market, whether it's a bad data point, uh, Trump tweet, China uh, retaliation, or devaluation of their own currency, we get a big bump in the TLT and GDX. Now, keep in mind, SPY, EEM, TLT, we're trading as though they are income generating products with call options typically sold out of the money above the asset and we're using that for income plus to help finance downside protection. Now, if you think the market's safe right now, you gotta be crazy. We're in the biggest bubble of history, and when this thing pops, you're gonna be very thankful that you, number one, had this exact setup to allocate your capital, and number two, furthermore, you had the put options, which give you the absolute protection uh, because the next time we do get a major crash, it is possible that the equity and bond bubble pops at once. Our simple four ETF portfolio is extremely diversified and all you'll need for retirement. Think about it. SPY ETF is the 504 top American companies, uh, which is about 25% of world GDP. The rest of the world GDP is over in Asia by and far, if you exclude Europe. And so Emerging Markets ETF serves uh, about 4.4 billion people, or almost two-thirds of the world's population. And so that ETF is extremely diversified with uh, hundreds of companies in it as well. So that's our setup on the equity side between the SPY and the Emerging Markets ETF. 
you have a very, very similar setup now as uh, both Stanley Druckenmiller, exactly the same exposure to emerging markets as he does, uh, and U.S. equities with a hefty treasury position. So if you like Stanley Druckenmiller and his 30% return for about 30 years straight, you like Ray Dalio and his portfolio, ours is designed to mimic just that. Uh, with less work and less things to keep track of. And again, we're aiming for income and safety, not growth or speculation. So simplify your holdings, reduce your risk, get better results with less work, and weatherproof your retirement portfolio. For every $300,000 invested, our goal is to generate a $3,000 per month profit. And if you look in the description box, we have a three-year financing plan that will give you lifetime access to both our boot camp, where I teach you every last thing you need to know about how to do this system, from options trading to the macro picture, how to analyze economic data, which YouTube and Twitter channels to follow the works. Or call Dean at 505-322-7515, and he can walk you through it as well and make sure you're on the right track. Here's a look at our disclaimer, which is also in the description box if you want to uh, get a link to it. Okay, let's take a look at today's trade alert, and then I'll jump into the topical information. Uh, headline today is Classic Smash and Grab by Emerging Markets. This is a critique of many political uh, leaders in U.S. history is that, uh, you know, if you ever wondered how a government official can become a multimillionaire to the tune of tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. Oftentimes it's by uh, helping out its investors who funded their campaigns and typically uh, they do that in a number of ways, mostly through policy and in general, uh, if we go back to the Obama administration, they went and attacked the coal industry and then the private education industry, and then guess what? His little buddy uh, came in there and bought up those assets 30 to 80% off and made a fortune from it. So what's been smashed in this administration? Well, if you haven't been paying attention, it is China. Now, the emerging market ETF uh, is not just China. It is all of the Asia area and gives you great exposure uh, to South Korea, to Japan, uh, to really the entire area. So it's a very well-diversified product, and I believe has quite a upside potential for us. Uh, now, to keep in mind, the Asia area is housing 4.4 billion people. And so these companies have lots of profits uh, to, to generate, and their equity market is not near all-time highs like the U.S. equity market. So just to get back to the 2017 high, uh, we need a 20% gain in emerging markets. So everybody from Drunken Miller to Ray Dalio to Jeffrey Gunlack have been touting that the time for emerging markets to eventually outperform U.S. equities is nearing and the dollar has trouble because of our deficits that are out of control. So that has not happened yet, clearly, uh, but we now have the catalyst to send emerging markets much higher, which is this phase one deal. Now, is the deal done? No. We'll take a look at what's happening with that. They're now saying they want all the tariffs removed uh, to sign phase one, which I doubt will happen. Uh, but we'll take a look at more of that information in a minute. Let's just review today's trade alert. And uh, real quick, I'll just look at our returns. So we can now see that uh, the SPY ETF has delivered $47,000 of our profit to date. The Tuesday trade, which has been rotating uh, between all sorts of assets from Apple to silver, uh, now to emerging markets, is up $18,000, utilizing 11% of our total assets. Our buy and hold portfolio, which has been rotating from Bitcoin, then into GLD and now into gold miners, has had some huge returns. It's up $53,000 or 53%. And then our bond portfolio is 40% of our total assets has a 15% return and $74,000 of our profits. And again, it's designed so that you're not gonna win on every asset every day. In fact, that's not what we want. We want one to go down while the other goes up. 
and then our put options kick in when big moves happen. And when those put options kick in, the losses stop on one asset while the other asset delivers huge returns. So in general, uh, you can see what our returns have looked like. I do want to point out that since August, uh, the S&P 500 is down 1%, but our portfolio is up 2.1. Uh, so we're outperforming the SPY considerably and with much less drawdown. Also, think about it. What's your maximum drawdown over the last year? How much were you down in December? How much were you down in May? December, you're probably down 10% uh, from October. And then in May, you're probably down 5%. Well, our portfolio is up 1.2% and up 2.2%. And that's because we have the stock bond portfolio with put options below to protect against any crazy sell-offs. And we've seen the SPY drop 5 to $10 in a day this year uh, because of all the uncertainty in the markets. Now, if you do look at the return on the Tuesday play, it is more volatile. So you can see we've had some bigger losses, but that's because this portfolio is higher risk, higher return, and less capital at risk. So far in October, the Tuesday trade is up 2.7%. Let's take a look at the most recent trade, how to get in and out. And folks, I highly doubt the US-China trade war is going to come to a long-term trade deal. If it does, great, we know how to play it. You ride the spy in the emerging markets for quite some time. We're going into QE and massive money is being pumped into the banks right now. So you wanna be long uh, risk assets, uh, but when it does break down, which I think it will, we'll be right back to silver, uh, which has a 250% potential return to get back to its uh, high from the last time the banks did QE. <clears throat> so I do want to point out, if we look at the Cold War against Russia, which was a much smaller opponent uh, with less uh, desire to really take over a large chunk of the GDP and become a dominant power, uh, in fact, China is actually on track. If they just continue even at half the growth rate they're on, their GDP will surpass the U.S. in no time. Uh, but look at how long the Cold War lasted. There was periods of peace and periods of escalation. And so being able to read between the lines, have the downside protection, uh, was key to doing well during this period of time. But here's just a little timeline. I'm not going to read it all, but look. The Cold War went from 1945 all the way to 1989, 79, oh, 89. Okay, so several decades, multiple presidents. That's how long we had to deal with the Cold War. So to expect the U.S.-China trade war to wrap up in two years is unrealistic. And all I'm saying is I think we're going to have a period of peace uh, while the two nations regroup, uh, China is, again, facing massive food inflation and the potential for a co-op within the Communist Party. Uh, so President Xi wants to help dampen down the food inflation prices and get rid of the tariffs, clearly. Meanwhile, Trump just wants to get reelected in 2020, and he's facing impeachment battles right now. Uh, plus, he's got his core group pissed off because of the tariffs China has attacked on the farms. So let's just take a look at the trade from last week through this week and then jump in today's content. Okay, so I'll check if we have any chat. Okay, John has a question. Uh, missed the first five minutes. How many shares would we buy? So you can scroll back, John, but I'll, I'll definitely cover that. Um, let me go back to that slide. Actually, it's in the trade alert. Here's your ratios for today. Uh, 100 SPY, 200 emerging markets, 200 TLT, 250 GDX per 75K. So keep it exactly at that ratio and you'll have what I'm advertising in our model portfolio verbatim. Uh, and I did optimize it to be exact. So you're extremely close to the allocation I have in the model portfolio uh, if you keep that ratio. So it's a one to two ratio on the SPY versus the TLT. And then uh, 
200 emerging markets per 100 SPY. Now, if you don't want the extra risk, don't take the Tuesday trade. And you would still keep the exact same allocation. And this would be a little safer. You'd have a little less uh, exposure to the equities market. Uh, but I really like emerging markets right now, uh, especially when we look at today's trade. Okay, so last Tuesday we sold the $18 call for a tiny credit of three cents, almost not worth doing, and that financed almost 50% of our downside protection on the put. Uh, this is when the SLV was trading at 16.55. Today we exited that position by buying back our call option for a penny, so that means we got to keep a couple cents on it, no big deal and we were able to sell our put option for seven cents. So we got a little bit of our money back overall, week over week. Uh, the silver ETF did not pull a profit. We lost 23 cents on the underlying asset as it traded from 16.55 to 16.32. The option caller, which cost five cents, paid back six for a profit of a penny. So we lost 22 cents a share. And again, we will be back to silver as soon as we get a good sign that phase one or phase two breaks down. Right now, I am expecting a period of peace uh, for the reasons we will uh, look at in the content, what I've just described. The new trade alert is selling to open the October 25th $43 call. And again, it's a tiny credit, six cents, and it's helping finance our October 25th, 41 put. So if we were to be exercised, you'd end up in cash, you'd get $43 a call, which is fine because right now it's trading at $41.92. Uh, so we have a potential of around $1.08 plus the credit we collected six cents on the upside. Now again, if EEM did go above 43, our put option would expire worthless and we'd lose that insurance. So the result of this loose option caller is it's going to be a drag on our profits to the upside. But if something breaks down in the trade deal or someone just suddenly starts attacking the emerging markets and sells heavily, we will walk away with a minimum of $41 a share on our portfolio. Here's the risk graph, which indicates if the EEM ETF goes above 43, uh, our profits get cut off. We do not enjoy profits above 43 on emerging markets through next Friday, although, of course, we're going to be out of it next Tuesday. Uh, and on the same breath, we will stop the bleeding if we go below 41. So we could have North Korea uh, shoot a nuke out and U.S.-China declare war in the next week, and this ETF crashes to 30 bucks a share. Guess what? We still get 41 because uh, of that put. So it's worth it to, uh, to take less potential profit and play it safe. Now, if you do go to the description box, we have a few links for you. One is if you'd like to upgrade to get our boot camp and advisory, we have a 16 uh, payment plan that's split up every other month. And if you've already bought any of our products, we'll refund that off the end of the trade history. If you'd like to view every trade alert we've ever issued, it's not password protected, it's right here. Click that, and if you'd like to look at our track record, it's right there. Okay, let's take a look at the content I've collected for today, and we'll get you guys on your way. China confirms phase one trade deal. Now, yesterday they were saying Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no, and that caused a little bit of a sell-off. Uh, today, they have said that U.S. statement on partial trade deal is accurate, but now there's rumors that they want the tariffs completely removed. I doubt that will happen. Foreign ministry companies have purchased 20 million tons of soybeans, 700,000 tons of pork, sorghum, wheat, cotton. They may actually buy some oil. Uh, so it does look like they are making purchases. This is what's been driving the SPY higher. I'm expecting a target return uh, for the SPY to go up to around 315 to 330 to enter a new danger zone as phase one gets completed. I don't think it'll break beyond that uh, until a phase two is done. Uh, and the problem is 
if things look too rosy, we may not get as dovish of a Fed as we want coming into October and December, the next two meetings where they may uh, do rate cuts. So potential return on the SPY from here is probably around 10% to close out the year if we get a good phase one deal and we get the uh, Fed dropping rates and doing QE, which they are doing. So I'm not too concerned about that. And emerging markets potentially a 20% return. And again, that is the SPY breaking into new highs and emerging markets simply getting back to its 2017 high uh, of around 52. So if there's no more escalation to close out the year, which I don't think there will be, uh, we could have some pretty nice steady returns from here uh, to close out the year and maybe even jump into January to hit those targets. Now they did say they would immediately start phase two talks, but that could be dragged out for quite some time uh, just to get them to buy some farming good products potentially twice as much as they used to uh, has taken two years. So those Chinese are very stubborn and like to drag their feet on this. And maybe they won't do it at all. Who knows? They've been doing this for two years. And that's again why we have to expose ourselves to treasuries and gold. If they back out, equities will tank once again. And that's how we have that balanced portfolio that protects us. Fed's Bullard, I think the Fed could handle a recession, but it would be best to avoid a recession by using all tools. Hope the Fed will launch a repo facility in the next six months. And T-bill purchases are definitely not QE. So funny. Uh, so the Fed is going towards zero interest rates and doing massive QE right now. They just want you to not call it QE. I've been talking about this for months. The banks are trapped in the treasury position. They know if they start to sell it, it would create a hysteria, uh, with, especially with the current administration creating record deficits. Uh, there's some trillions of dollars of treasuries that have to be sold in the next 12 months. And so all the banks were in on this. They knew that eventually the Fed was going to let them out, and that's what they're doing. They're letting them out for massive profits uh, there's no way they could sell all these uh, treasuries and then collateri collateralized loan obligations on corporate debt. So between those two, the bank's balance sheets are loaded with uh, bonds they could never sell. And this is getting liquidated to the, tre uh, to the Fed. So now they have brand new balance sheet. And guess what Goldman Sachs is doing? A hiring spree and probably record uh bonuses for their folks. TLT has sold off significantly. This is our second losing month on the TLT since conception, and that's perfectly fine. I do think the TLT will live another day, and its downside risks are somewhat limited because we have the Fed dropping rates to zero and massively uh, buying up these t treasuries. So I, I love having the TLT as our insurance play because I believe it has limited downside risk uh, in this environment. And if something goes hairy uh, in our equities play, TLT is there to save the day. GDX, all you got to know is if the Fed is dropping rates and doing QE, or you think they're going to do that, you want to be long precious metals. And that's really the only time you want to be long precious metals. Uh, they don't generate profits. They don't have rent. They're really just something that goes up in value when both the Fed is dropping rates and doing QE. And that's why we've seen this nice little rally in gold this year, uh, because the market was predicting this would happen. In our boot camp, we're dying to short the Chinese currency, uh, but the time is not yet. We need either the phase one or phase two trade deal to break down, and the Chinese will be back to their favorite method of offsetting tariffs, uh, which is devaluing their currency. So I believe this trade is in the near future, uh, but not until uh, trade talks break down once again. Bitcoin, Ethereum, same thing. If we know the Fed is lowering interest rates and printing money, that's the signal to go long these assets. Instead of just having 10% in gold, or rather GDX, the gold miners, we actually have 8% in GDX, 1% in Bitcoin, and 1% in Ethereum. I just want to point out the trading volume on Ethereum has been half that of Bitcoin as long as I can remember this year. 
even though its market cap is something like one eighth. So that's very impressive. I think Ethereum will definitely outperform Bitcoin uh, in this period of time coming up in the next 12 months. So expect most likely in our portfolio to sell Bitcoin when it's around 1500 uh, and then rotate Bitcoin into a more risky coin, uh, probably either Ripple or EOS or maybe the Binance coin. We'll see which one, but I'm only trying to play two cryptocurrencies at a time. Right now it's Bitcoin and Ethereum. Same idea we saw with gold. Play spot gold till it gets elevated, then rotate into the gold miners. Dollar index is still strong. Uh, that is probably going to change as we continue to drop rates towards zero and print massive amounts of money. Uh, but for the time being, that's another reason to be long. All the US products, all the emerging markets are trying to pay their US denominated debts in dollars and they're printing money, exchanging it into the dollar to try to do that. So the relief rally for emerging markets is here once they sign that phase one deal. I think we'll see a rush of capital into China and other emerging markets, which desperately needed at this point. Now, if phase one deal breaks down, emerging markets is going to be wrecked as they definitely need to expand their credit to keep this uh, bubble they've been pushing going along. The 30-year German yield is above zero, uh, which we've seen also reflected in the TLT. So I'd look at the German bond to try to get a feel for where rates are he headed. Their short-term rates are still negative, and I think uh, given a little more stress and uncertainty uh, at some point, which I think will be very hard to predict, U.S. rates can go down significantly from here. Now, the price of oil is down to 53. That's alarming. That needs to go up. Uh, otherwise, a lot of oil companies will be in trouble and would signal some serious growth problems. Uh, so keeping a close eye on that. Gold finally below 1500, but I don't think it'll go much lower as we have the, uh, the two main keys. We have lowering rates plus asset purchases by the Fed. Only last ingredient gold needs to continue to rise is another scare, which I think is almost certain to happen. The gold to silver ratio is at a 26 year discrepancy. Uh, so a lot of people are hoping that silver will jump up towards a 22 to $25 range, which I think will happen during the next big scare. Although I just think that has been delayed because of this phase one trade deal. Here's some content I've collected. Kyle Bass, probably not very happy about the most recent uh, trade progress or truce. One of the greatest ever was just woke, just went from woke to joke. It's sad to see LeBron's social justice overwhelmed by NBA blood money, China. So LeBron says that uh, Hong Kong protests are misinformed and uneducated. <laughs> Fed liquidity surging to $90 billion. They don't want to scare everybody by calling it QE, but it is the same. IMF sees China growth slowing from 6.1 to 5.8. Here's China's credit impulse. China's in a tough spot. Their, their, their inflation rate is around 3%, which typically scares uh, central bankers. Uh, but they're desperate for another credit pulse impulse, which I think is around the corner. We're seeing the Fed do it, so most likely China will jump in and follow suit. Usually it's the U.S. copying whatever the Chinese do, uh, but because of their inflation, I think they've had a hard time uh, being able to put much more capital into their country. Here's the IMF Global Economic Outlook. You can see that drop to a negative print in 2008, uh, which is what everyone's fearful of. I don't think that's going to happen when we have 80% of all central banks lowering rates, printing money. Usually the US will wait till a stock market crash to print money, but this time uh, they're not waiting for anything. They are aggressively uh, buying up debt Dow, NASDAQ, race trade deal, sell the news, losses, gold slammed. 
which is fine. We're not too concerned about a little volatility in our gold position. Uh, James Bullard is already forecasting that we will cut rates at the end of this month. The plot grows ever thicker. Trump lawyer Giuliani was paid 500 grand to consult indicted associates firm. I'll have to look into that. Didn't have a chance to read that yet. Hunter Biden admits he would probably not have gotten Ukrainian board seat without his daddy. Uh, ABC is doing an interview on this. His storyline, just look up Glenn Beck. He's got a ton of content on this topic. Uh, the kid is a mess. It'll be interesting to see how touch how sensitive the questions uh, from ABC are. Plus, we have uh, the next Democratic debate coming up. Warren Elizabeth is kicking ass, taking names, and is the Democrats' worst nightmare. Uh, so this is comical. It's almost like the Trump surprise uh, for the Republican Party. We now have the Elizabeth Warren. Um, and in Ukraine, they had a talk show host get elected when the Democrats thought they had a little monopoly and money laundering operation out there. Uh, so this whole populist movement is really, really taking a fast pace. This was an animation, uh, but if you, if you replay it, basically for the last few decades, it was US, Japan were the top two leaders and China was a whole lot of nothing. And really, especially in the last five years and 10 years, China, has gone from something like a billion dollar GDP up to $13 trillion at rapid pace. That's what this trade war is about, is who's the dominant player. And I think if you do game theory, these two parties realize they can't really change each other, so they'll just do whatever they can to slow one another down. And they certainly accomplished that over the last two years, uh, and now they're taking a little period of peace. So again, if you look at the Cold War timeline, it could last decades. This may be a fight that I'm talking about when I am your age and we're 30 years into the future, 40 years into the future. So period of peace, that's our play today. Um, how has China got out of its last few slumps? This is a little summary of it. 2008, the global financial crisis, the PRC experienced only a mild economic slowdown during this crisis, the country's GDP growth in 07 was 14%, but this dropped to 9% uh, the next few years. They printed a little bit of money uh, during that period following suit of the U.S. Uh, come 2012 and 13, they had another slowdown, and that's when they came up with the Belt and Road Initiative. So they were just building massive amounts of skyscrapers and houses that nobody was using uh, all within uh, China to the point it got absolutely ridiculous. And then they realized they need to start building elsewhere. They came up with the Belt and Road Initiative, China's ambitious plans to develop road, rail, and sea routes across 152 countries is scheduled for completion by 2049. Uh, again, so that allowed them to increase their debt, print more money, borrow more money, and keep those you know, about 300 million people busy constructing stuff. Uh, and then they almost had another slowdown and another crash so they again decided to avoid a recession and increase their money supply and their debt uh, so they have a massive amount of debt that at some point will pop and most likely put the entire world in a great depression uh, just timing so if we had continued the uh, tariffs and the threats and uh, sanctions on china i think they would have popped uh, in the next several months and definitely caused a major recession into the 2020 election. And I don't think Trump wants that. That's why I was expecting exactly what we got. Farm deal for a delay in tariffs. Um, 2015, they came out with Made in China 2025, where they said they need to start innovating and creating domination in different industries. Uh, so that did another credit pulse boost uh, so what will they do this time? Perhaps it's just simply uh, coming to terms with the U.S. and opening up their, themselves up for investment, which they desperately need. Here's that 70 years of the economic development. 
of the People's Republic of China, which they just celebrated uh, about, about two, two weeks ago. It was quite a show. Lots of nukes and uh, military folks, all kinds of weaponry marching down, uh, I believe it was Shanghai or Beijing. Okay, here's their problem. Inflation, food inflation uh, is up significantly in 2019. And this is from them devaluing their currency. They can only devalue their currency so much uh, before it will create unrest and uproar with their populace. Uh, so that puts their central bank in a tough spot and really forces them to need outside capital. And then meanwhile, we have on their bigger data a double whammy. So the PPI is crashing uh, while the CPI is rising. So that is a nightmare. Their demand for uh, industrial manufacturing products is dropping while Prices for common goods, their, their average Joe needs is at 3%. So they're in a very tough spot. China's CPI rose at the fastest rate year over year since 2013. Sanders goes for the jugular, <laughs> could slap billionaires with this 97.5% effective tax rate. So tune in to CNN tonight for the next Democratic debate. And plus the Joe Biden ABC interview. I'm not sure when that hits. Uh, so there you go. We got the double whammy. China's facing inflation and deflation in the worst ways possible. Meanwhile, Bank of Japan will keep rates low as long as they need through at least 2020. Here is your banks and their reserves. You can see in 2019 they sucked up uh, some what is that? That's about $250 billion of probably treasuries and CLOs uh, that have potentially put them in a very tight predicament. That's why we have this repo market coming in. That's why we have $100 billion a month being fed to the banks to free up their balance sheets. We're probably going to get a half a billion dollar one-time injection coming up uh, this year. And then another, again, $100 billion bucks a month for the foreseeable future. And all this is doing is letting the banks get maximum profit on those treasuries that they could never sell and freeze up their balance sheet to do what? I think they're going to load up on the SPY and Emerging Markets ETF. McConnell is married to a lady whose dad owns a huge Chinese uh, shipping company. Uh, so this is one of the political leaders on the Republican side we got to keep a close eye on. Uh, now, he has been putting out some pretty strong statements related to China. And um, what I'm concerned about is with the Middle East, the pullout, is he losing some conservative support? This piece from McConnell certainly says that. Is he trying to maybe swing some Democratic votes if there was an impeachment? I'm not too sure, uh, but something we got to keep a close eye on. Uh, because if we did impeach Trump and then we got Elizabeth Warren in there, what on earth is going to happen? Uh, <laughs> and, and not that I think that would happen, but we got to be ready for the unexpected. Hong Kong's monetary authority is preparing for a deep recession and a banking crisis. So for our boot camp folks, we got to wait for another catalyst. I think there's a period of easing coming for China and Hong Kong, but I do want to short both the Hong Kong dollar and the chi Chinese yuan. Uh, the next time things look like they're getting uh, frisky. Now, I think phase one will go through, but phase two, highly doubt. Wow, Hunter Biden is being forced to leave a Chinese company. Now watch the fake news wrap their greasy and very protective arms around him. Only softball questions, please. And rumors Michael Bloomberg and Hillary may run, uh, as it looks like Joe Biden's chances are slipping rapidly. And the worst case scenario for the Democrats would be Elizabeth. China has the market demand to buy 40 to $50 billion worth of U.S. farm products. Chinese won't make a commitment that it can't honor. Once it promises, it will fulfill it. Sure. Sure. Okay, South Park has been absolutely cracking me up. Last week was episode two of their new season where they're the first big media company to really attack the Chinese, and it was good. Uh, they released a third episode that also 
uh, made fun of China. So it's great to see some American uh, writers who are not scared and censored by China. And I never realized all these Hollywood videos, if they want to go sell this video in China and probably double their revenues, they also have to meet the Chinese censorship. So now U.S. content is effectively being censored by Chinese Communist Party. Um, so, again, I don't think we're coming to a long-term deal with China. I think this is a short-term relief that could last as long as the election, but maybe not. Maybe it breaks down sometime in January, February, March after we close out phase one, which is expected to potentially sign uh, November 15th in Chile when she and Trump are both in the same place. Uh, like the NBA, this is a South Park quote, we welcome the Chinese censors into our homes and into our hearts. We too love money more than freedom and democracy. She doesn't look just like Winnie the Pooh at all. Tune into our 300th episode, episode this Wednesday at 10. Long live the great Communist Party of China. May this autumn sorghum harvest be bountiful. We good now, China? Oh, man. Uh, Chinese exports dropping. Again, there's tariffs which are hurting the exports, and they're also offsetting those costs by devaluing their currency. So China is in some serious pain. Wrap up today with another summary of today's trade and let you guys go. Again, classic smash and grab. The Obama administration did this to the coal industry and to the private education. Uh, put all kinds of sanctions on these different companies, crush their prices dramatically lower, and then the same people who paid for his campaign finances went in and massively bought up these and their hedge funds for huge profits. Is this the same thing that's happening in this administration with China, perhaps? Are we at the bottom of the smash? I don't know. I expect that we have a period of peace. That's the reason why we're going long emerging markets. Emerging market sells products to 4.46 billion people. Keep in mind the SPY ETF primarily sells to 350 million people. If you look at the U.S.'s GDP, it is hogging the wealth. It has about five times the wealth of the average citizen around the world. So certainly the SPY is the strongest place to put your money. That's where we have most of our capital. But right now, the SPY is near all-time highs. Emerging markets is significantly sold off for good reason. Just to get back to recent highs, there's a potential 20% run on emerging markets. And again, uh, some of the bigger companies in this, I'm afraid, are Alibaba and Tencent. Uh, but you got to realize Tencent is something like the Microsoft plus every other software company in America combined into one giant subsidized massive, massive business in China. Alibaba is huge with this relief coming, uh, with potential tariffs being removed, without all this downward pressure. Uh, the top two positions in emerging markets could really fly higher. Guess who has huge positions in those two companies? Ray Dalio, Stanley Drunkenmiller, two of the most successful hedge fund uh, investors of all time. Do I like being supportive of China? No. Do I want to deliver some easy profits to our clients? Yes. And again, this has exposure to all of Asia, not just China. You get your Samsung, you get all kinds of goodies, South Korea, Japan, all the surrounding countries. Uh, so it's really a great growth play after having this stress on it uh, being relieved. I really like this trade. The allocation strategy that we're recommending is to have 100 SPY, 200 EEM, 200 TLT. Those are being protected by selling call options and then buying put options below. And we're trading the SPY Monday, Wednesday, Friday, emerging markets Tuesday, and the TLT on Thursday. Meanwhile, we're not doing any protection on gold. All you need to worry about is gold are the three magic ingredients. Number one is the Fed lowering rates, yes. Two. Is the Fed buying treasuries? Yes. Three, last ingredient is we need some scare and shock. Is there a reason for scare and shock? Certainly. Phase one or phase two trade deal breaking down and you've got your shock. So we want to just hold that gold, maintain any drawdown, no problem. Uh, and meanwhile, 
equities are what I expect will be paying our income this month and next month and most likely December as well. As we get closer to this November 15th, where we expect a signing, I will loosen up our collar. Uh, right now we're trying to have a very tight collar as we have a good month to wait for these markets to get probably to, uh, to a proper price relative to, this, to the trade, trade deal news flow. So expect some drawdown in your TLT and GDX. But realize that's your insurance. Whenever something unexpected hits the equities market, your TLT and your GDX will save the day uh, immediately. And then if equities really crash because something really awful has happened, then our put options kick in. Uh, so that's the setup. If we look at our returns, I do want to point out how well we're doing. If you look at the S&P 500 at the end of July, it was at all-time high. From there to today, we're down around 1%. Our portfolio is up 2.1%, or I guess 1.8 now. So we're outperforming the S&P 500. And again, if we look at May, S&P 500 was down 5%. We're up 2.2. If you go through December, S&P 500 fell 10%, and we're up 1.2. So again, it's not just about generating return. It's about generating return with low drawdown. And if you're ready to join our program and get the boot camp plus the advisory, what you'll get is a lot of stuff that's not just in our advisory. There's a link in the description box. Here's a quick look at our boot camp. It's Monday Q&A webinar, Tuesday a lecture. The lecture is going to be interactive where we're teaching you our program inside out. And here's an outline. The boot camp does repeat itself. So if you don't learn everything the first time around, Take it the next 16 weeks or the next 16 weeks. Once you purchase the boot camp once, you have unlimited access. The first module is big picture. We're going to look at 100 years of U.S. history and show how the TLT can save your ass 90% of the time as long as you're long your equities. You have a very smooth return uh, with very, very little drawdown. Uh, after that, we get into more of the technical stuff. Call options, put options, option callers how to get crypto, how to fill out a spreadsheet. If you like my spreadsheet, we give you a copy of it and for three weeks we'll fill it out together and teach you how to use it, what to do during a financial crisis, what to do after a financial crisis. And the last two weeks will be our more advanced trades where we do spreads and option writing. Also, there are bonus trades that take advantage of the futures market as well as spreads. Uh, only for boot camp members, which again are a little more difficult than uh, our average income trade, which is just buy the asset, sell the call, buy the put. All right, guys, thank you so much for your time. Tomorrow we'll close out our SPY trade, uh, which uh, let's check, look, check out how much that SPY has rallied. 299. Oh man, we've missed out on a good dollar of profits on the SPY because we played it a little safer yesterday. We sold the very juicy 297 call. Uh, so we got to keep the uh, $1.70 credit, I think, and, um, and stopped enjoying the profits around 297.70, which is okay. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Let's see if we have any questions before I close this out. Okay, a little shout out to the people chatting. Ron, John, thanks for chatting with us. Any questions before I let you guys go? All right, gentlemen, I appreciate it. And keep a lookout for our spy trade tomorrow at noon.